In this video, I want to talk a little bit about a highly debated topic within the HVAC industry, and that's checking air conditioning systems without the use of gauges. Now, I do have a couple initial comments before we go heavily into this video. This video is about checking gauges with charge without using gauges. I know that there's some technicians out there that do not ever do this. There's some strongly against this practice, and there's some who feel strongly that this is the correct way to do things. I'm here to talk about how this works and a discussion of why this is favorable practice rather than have a big debate about it. This is not for everybody. If you don't believe in this practice, if your employer says otherwise, skip on by this. But otherwise, hopefully this will bring some light onto why we want to do this. This procedure is not for a first time visit to a system or for the start of commissioning of a system. For those events, you absolutely have to put gauges onto the system. Why not to connect? There are several benefits to the customer, the company, and the technician not to connect gauges on every service call, especially for preventative maintenance. It's non-invasive, okay? You do non-invasive measurements with only temperature data taken, the exact same way you would check on refrigeration system with no ports available. The measuring design temperature differences and line set piping Temperatures are non-invasive. They involve less liability, both for the system and technician safety. And it demonstrates a technical knowledge and a knowledge of best practices. It's better for the environment and the refrigeration system since it saves R22 and R410A from being released to the atmosphere. It's a time savings at sites. Technicians can concentrate on the other aspects of preventative visits related to airflow, condensate drainage, and electrical checks. It eliminates more callbacks and premature system cooling and heating performance problems, as well as failures due to cross-contamination, moisture contamination, and lost refrigerant. It saves the customer money on refrigerant being added due to connection losses. Now let's just again, just to level set and talk a little bit about why and how this all works, okay? And I do want to give credit for this picture to the HVAC school. It's Brian Orr and www.hvacschool.com. Okay, a long time ago, he told me that I can use his images when I'm doing training and stuff like that. So I, I think that's just awesome. It's one of the better pictures of a refrigeration system that I've seen. Okay, if you take a look at this system, there are no holes in it for refrigeration, for refrigerant to be used up, depleted, or destroyed. So when you install a system and when you do your first check on a system, it has the same amount of refrigerant in it that it's going to have 10 years down the road. If it doesn't, we have a problem. Okay. Now, year to year, you, can, I, you will see dirt build up. And we're going to talk more about that because dirt and airflow are your primary problems unless you have a service call. So one of the things we're going to talk about is the design temperature difference. Design temperature difference of the coils after a system is newly commissioned or the first time assessed with gauges should not change over the life of a sealed refrigeration system unless one of the following has developed. The first thing and the primary thing we see is if you have an airflow restriction with dirt buildup as a cause, such as a dirty outside coil, dirty indoor coil, dirty filter, dirty blower blades, return or supply duct restrictions, blower motor speed adjustments, blower motor operating problems, and of course, we cannot leave off the homeowner installing the newer restrictive air filters. For example, the 3M catch everything filters or the 99% efficient filters. Those do cause problems. Okay, now here, who's going to adjust a blower motor speed? Okay, we talk about blower motor speed adjustments. Who's going to be the one adjusting speed? It's a technician. Okay, so we either have dirt a technician, or a homeowner causing problems with airflow. You can have critical component failures. It's not to say it won't happen, but the majority of the time it doesn't. Okay, critical component, TXVs. 
Okay, um, compressor. Refrigerant flow restrictions are a problem that can occur. Okay, and they will affect design temperature differences. So after the first visit or commissioning, subsequent system checkups and preventatives can and should be performed without attaching gauges. You're going back to the design temperature differences that you took when you were performing your initial visit. So let's talk about best practices. Not attaching gauges following the first visit without good reason is the correct best practice and will minimize several liabilities. First and foremost is techs introducing contamination to the system, such as air, moisture, and acidic oil from other systems. You can also slowly lower refrigerant levels by techs not pumping down their gauges back into the system when they take their tech gauges off. Hoses carry refrigerant. Caps being lost and left off. Schrader valve ports starting to leak. The more you use a Schrader valve port, the more likely it is going to be leak. The little rubber seals around there don't stand up well to constant use and constant oil. Reduce safety injuries for technicians because of refrigerant related injuries. Face it, it happens. People take their gauges off, they get um, refrigerant on their hands, which causes fr freeze burns, frost burns. You can get refrigerant and oil in your eyes. And we all know how well technicians sometimes in the field follow proper safety with safety glasses and gloves. Doesn't happen. So before we can do our gaugeless assessments, you, there has to be an initial assessment. Okay, now the initial assessment can be done at the startup of a newly installed system and should be done at the startup of a newly installed system or it can be done on your first company's first visit to a system. You have several data points that must be recorded. Okay, without these, you cannot do a full evaluation of a system. You have to know the temperature difference between the supply and return ducts. It's in dry bulb, and it will change based on relative humidity. The lower the relative humidity, the greater the temperature difference. The higher the relative humidity, the lower the temperature difference. And this is because of the latent heat required to be removed to dehumidify air. If I have a low relative humidity, I can do more sensible cooling. That's the temperatures you can measure. The higher the relative humidity, I have to remove more latent heat to dehumidify before I can cool. The evaporator difference between the return air dry bulb and the refrigeration saturation temperature of the coil. Okay, again, the evaporator temperature difference, design temperature difference, is the difference between the return air dry bulb and the refrigeration saturation temperature of the coil. The evaporator outlet temperature, that's the suction line at the evaporator, and you might as well get superheat while you're there. The total external static pressures Take the pressure in the supply duct plenum. Take the pressure in the return plenum. Drop the positive and negative signs. You want the absolute value and add them together. Make sure you plug any test holes you make. Put a plug in it because you're going to use these in the future. The pressure drop across the filter is extremely important. The pressure drop across the evaporator. You need to note if it's wet or dry. The indoor blower amperage. Okay, with the panels on. Don't know how many of you know this, but when you take your panels off and take your amperages, the blower motor amperage is going to change. It's actually going to increase with the panels off. The reason for this, air has weight. The amperages go up if you have to move more air. Okay, if your panels are off, you're going to be moving more air through that blower motor because the size of the opening for the door is much greater than the size of the opening for the return duct. So you want to take your amperages with the panels on. Compare it to the nameplate amperages. Suction line temperature and superheat at the condenser inlet. Okay, and I'll go back in a few minutes and we'll talk about why I care about these. Okay, the first suction line temperature and superheat you took was at the evaporator inlet. Now you're taking one at the condenser inlet. 
Then you're going to take the condenser design temperature difference or split. That's the difference between the high side temperature, the saturation, and the air entering the condenser. You want to take the liquid line temperature and you might as well calculate your subcooling while you're there at the condenser outlet. You want to take the condenser air inlet and outlet temperatures. You want to take the compressor and outdoor fan amperages and compare it to the nameplate. You want to take the measured suction temperature difference between the suction line leaving the evaporator and entering the compressor. You already have the readings, just write it down. You want to measure the liquid line temperature difference between the liquid line leaving the condenser and entering the metering device. Okay, those are your first assessments. Now, just a reminder, this benchmark data will not change during the lifetime of system unless one of the following occurs. Airflow restriction, component failure, refrigerant flow restriction. A refrigeration system is a sealed system. Once the values are recorded, things do not magically change without a problem. So once you have your initial readings, you get them entered into wherever your company or you store this equipment, preferably throw a tape of um, sheet of paper to the in, inside of one of the doors, one of the access panels, so that you have it in the future. Okay. On follow-up visits and PM, the data you need to record and evaluate is actually pretty simple. The delta T, which is the temperature difference between the supply and return, take humidity into account. The evaporator outlet suction line temperature. The total external static pressure. Remember, supply plenum, return plenum, drop the signs. The static pressure drop across the filter. The static pressure drop across the evaporator coil. The suction line temperature of the condenser. The liquid line temperature at the condenser outlet. The condenser air inlet, which is your ambient air. The condenser air outlet above the fan and the average draw, the amperage draws of the outdoor fan motor, indoor fan motor, and compressor. Now, once you have these readings, you have to compare the, all the new readings back to the benchmark numbers to see if any problems have developed or are developing. Okay, what this does, it shows value to the customer. It allows you to provide any needed services such as filter change, coil cleaning, and blower maintenance. You can address any electrical issues Okay, identify them and correct them. Once the repairs are complete, take the readings again and show the customer the improvements. Okay, your improvements should be back to benchmark values. So let's just take a quick look at a couple of these readings and why do I care about them? Okay, temperature difference between the supply and return tells me a lot about what's happening in the refrigeration system as well as air movement. Okay, do I have enough air moving across that coil? Evaporator outlet suction line temperature tells me a lot about what's happening with the metering device and the heat exchange in that coil. Total external static pressure, again, airflow. Okay, static pressure drop across the filter. Do I have a dirty filter? Static pressure drop across the coil is extremely important. Do I have a dirty evaporator coil? Again, you have to, though, note, you have to make sure you're testing it in the same condition. If your original test was with a dry coil, you have to test with a dry coil. If your original test was with wet coil, test with a wet coil. Okay. Static pressure drop will increase with dirt on both the filter and the evaporator coil. Suction line temperature at the condenser. Okay, if all of a sudden I have a big temperature drop or increase between the suction line temp at the evaporator and the suction line at the condenser, you can look for a restriction. You can also look at that this is a part of superheat. The lower the refrigerant levels, the quicker that temperature is going to increase. Liquid line temperature of the condenser outlet. Okay, if all of a sudden that temperature spikes at the condenser outlet, I'm not rejecting heat. Okay, because again, refrigerant levels don't change, but where where could I not be rejecting heat? It's a dirty condenser coil or a fan problem. 
condenser air inlet, condenser air outlet. Okay, again, I'm looking at heat exchange with the outdoor environment. Amperage draws of outdoor fan motor, indoor fan motor and compressor. Tells me electrical issues, okay? Capacitor health. All of these things come up with amp draws. Okay, now in terms of the compressor, all of a sudden, if I have problems in the rest of the refrigeration system and I have very low compressor amperage, you know what? I'm going to put gauges on the system. Okay. My compressor amperage will also change if I'm not rejecting heat, like with a dirty coil. If I, an example here, let's talk about if I have a high um, pressure drop across the evaporator coil and I have very low compressor amperages and low temperature exchange with the or across the condenser. I have a dirty evaporator coil. So all of these things come together and actually give you the information of what you need to fix if you evaluate it. Okay. Again, once the repairs are completed, take readings again and show the customer the improvements. I probably also should have said in here that anytime you fix something, let the system run for 10 to 15 minutes before you take your readings again. You got to let it stabilize. Things do not just change in a few seconds. A few additional notes. Airflow through filters, blowers, evaporator, condenser coils will never magically increase from those baseline readings. They will only decrease. And the reason for this decrease will be dirt buildup. Okay, what I'm basically saying is your 13 sear system that you took your initial reading on will not suddenly become a 16 sear system. So you will never increase these readings and make them better than your baselines. So watch out for that. Systems should not be benchmarked with a wet condenser coil or if the liquid line temperature is at or below the ambient dry bulb temperature. Okay, make sure you work with a dry condenser coil. You need the air to be flowing through it and moist and wetness on that coil will restrict moist airflow. And another note on the compressor, okay, maximum inlet temperature of the suction line of the compressor should be below 65 degrees. If it is not, the compressor will have the potential to overheat and oil breakdown can occur due to excessive discharge and superheat temperatures. Finally, if your follow-up readings are not near the benchmark readings, 5% or so, or with airflow, like static pressures, even closer than that, you may need to put gauges onto the system to determine why. But before you put gauges on, look for airflow and cleanliness of the coils, filters, and the blower. And whatever you do, do not ever leave a system without taking static pressure readings. It, it sort of amazes me sometimes that everyone is so quick to put gauges on a system, but they do not even carry the tools to properly take a static pressure reading. So as I said at the beginning of this presentation, you may not believe in, gauge, in testing a refrigeration system, air conditioning system without putting your gauges on, but it is absolutely positive possible to do, you can actually help the customer because of contamination and refrigerant loss, and you can still provide value to your customers based on the temperature and pressure readings you're taking. You cannot do this whole process if you do not take pressure readings in terms of air pressure. They're very important. Give it a try.